What's up guys, what's going on? Max Brown back here for another whiteboard breakdown. This week looking at the USC versus Oregon game, the Pac-12 championship. The Ducks got it done over the Trojans and a few things stuck out to me in this game. One, where was that Oregon team all year long? That was not necessarily a three and two team. I felt like they outplayed USC. Yes, USC had some mistakes, but I thought Oregon got it done in the trenches and that was a big reason why they won that game. The second thing that stuck out is the cardiac kids that USC was all year long. The magic finally ran out. And the third area that stuck out to me was the timely and costly mistakes from USC, both in the penalty department, but also some of the turnovers and some of the areas of the game that USC failed to execute. And a few of those areas specifically are the interception. In this video, we'll look at all three of those interceptions. I'll take you inside Keaton's helmet where the mistake was made, where the read was wrong, or where the decision was wrong in general, and then how to correct it moving forward. So this is the first time you're checking out one of my breakdowns. Thank you for joining in. We've been doing this all season long, been a blast. Hope to continue it through the off season. Uh, but without further ado, let's jump to early on in the first quarter. Uh, it's a third and 10 play, and Keaton Slovis throws his first of three interceptions on the day. From the 35 and early third and 10, Slovis steps into one. It is intercepted. The Amador Lenore. And then foul. jumps the Face ball. Pass. You'll see him at the top of your screen on the right. Seven. Sits on it, Half triggers. First Just down a Oregon. flat miss. That's late. All right, so what happened here? What went wrong? I'll start with the, uh, the Oregon side of things. Oregon's going to come out in man coverage, but they're going to bring a very popular blitzing scheme in the middle called a cross dog blitz. They're going to bring the Mike linebacker coming from the left side. And he's going to cross over to the right. They're going to bring the will right off his butt down to the left. As you can probably imagine, it can be hard for offensive lines to communicate with this because usually you're kind of dictating things left and right. When someone comes from the left and goes right, that's where things can get confusing. But this blitz especially is a very common blitz. I guarantee USC's offensive line is repped against this, especially... Yeah, even with a short week, like we talked about a bunch last week, even with a short week, I guarantee they repped a, repped a bunch of this. Look, on the back end, Oregon's just going to go man coverage, which is interesting, right? Because we've talked a bunch about, hey, when USC gets man coverage, that's when they want to attack. That's an advantageous look. But what's different about the Oregon Ducks is they got some athletes out here to at least match up with USC. I still think they're at a disadvantage most of the time when you line up in man coverage. But when you have a corner like Diamador Lenore, who can at least make it hard on Tyler Vaughn's for sure, if not more, as we saw in this play. That's where Oregon has an advantage against other Pac-12 teams. So that's the blitz in the middle. They're running man coverage. Good to note that the free safety is on the left side of the ball, but he's just playing center field. On USC side of the ball, from my vantage point, this just looks like four verts. Four verts, uh, two verts here, two verts here. You got four receivers here on the USC side of the ball. A couple little nuances to note. One is with the corners. The corners are sitting right at the sticks. If I had drawn a line here as the first down, they're sitting right at the sticks. They know it's third and 10. They know what USC is gonna try to do is some route concept that allows them to sit right at 10, 11 yards and obviously pick up the first down. So they're not idiots, right? They know what's coming and as a result, their eyes are gonna be on the QB. Oftentimes when you get man coverage out here, you got a corner right, right up against Tyler Vaughn's. He can't really see what the quarterback's doing. It's just hard in the corner versus here. These corners have their eyes on Keaton. They're looking in. They're trying to anticipate exactly like what happens right here of what's going to go on. The second little nuance is the protection scheme. Because Oregon brings this, or actually I'll back up a little bit. For USC's offensive line, they're going to count these four. They're going to get these four defensive linemen, and then they're going to slide towards the Mike linebacker. They're going to slide towards the left. And so they'll pick up the Mike in protection right here. The guy that's responsible, uh, that Stephen Carr is responsible to pick up is the Will linebacker. He's the extra rusher. And so as a result, Stephen Carr does his job and picks up the Will linebacker. So protection-wise, you're all good here. There is some heat. It's not a perfectly clean pocket. But protection-wise, you're here. But the point I want to emphasize is because Stephen Carr is in the protection, he then can't get out in a check down or a little release right here. He can't do that. And so you have all this concept down the field, but you have no underneath routes. And that's kind of what I mean when I say, hey, I want answers. For Keaton Slovis, he doesn't necessarily have all the answers in the world because he doesn't have a check down or a safety valve he can get to. But that's football. That's totally fine. They're going to bring cross dog. Keaton knows he's picked up, but he also in the back of his mind should know that he doesn't have a check down. The free safeties over there towards the left. Why is he to the left? 
uh, the fields to that side. That's one reason. Maybe they're guarding against Amon Ross St. Brown if they feel like he's the most dangerous receiver on a nickel Sam defender right there. Maybe they're helping that way. But if you're Keen Slovis, right when I get the snap, I, my first step, I would keep that safety on this side of the field. Keep him over there, and he knows that he's going to come over here to the right. Once he comes over to the right, he knows he only has two answers on this side. Drake London in the slot, and Tyler Vaughn's on the outside. What's unique about this play is Keaton ends up being late to the sideline. It's an, it's an inaccurate throw as well, but he's late on this throw. And a big reason why he's late is he's seeing what kind of release Drake London can get right here on the safety. If Drake London can cross face, and make a play there, there's a big window right there. And we've seen that time and time again from these two hooking up on that sort of route. That's a luxury because you hang on just a little bit longer to see if Drake London can make a play. But if this was an average average Joe slot receiver and you're the quarterback right here, the second you know you're out leveraged and this safety is inside and it's gonna be very, very hard to cross face, then you would just get outside right away. The blessing and the curse of having Drake London here is Keaton Slovis instinctually knows, hey, maybe I just hang on just a little bit longer. Let me see if, I can, if he can cross face. Let me see if he can use his size and athleticism to get over the top. And by hanging on just that half beat, it hurts him on the outside because Keaton gets over to Tyler Vaughn's just a second late. That's the first thing that goes wrong in terms of the, in terms of the read, I guess you could say. But the big thing is this is obviously just an inaccurate throw. When you're throwing to the sideline, this ball should be, I mean, running out of whiteboard right here. It should be right on the edge. Allow Tyler Vaughns to make a play outside his frame, get his feet in bounds. The cardinal sin for a quarterback is throwing outbreaking routes or sideline routes inside. You pair that with an NFL corner right there in Diamador Lenore, and that's why that pick happened. But it's interesting to note that his read brings him over to the right. He probably hangs on Drake London just a little bit longer because he, that, that's been his safety blanket. That, that by him hanging on uh, on to Drake London in the past, it's worked out for him. It did not here cause him to be late, ends up throwing an inaccurate throw, and Oregon makes him pay. That's the first interception. Let's check out the second. Second down and eight. Slovis well protected. Again, good coverage downfield and another interception. Jamal Hill this time. Be your answer the late lob downfield. I mean, he's had a lot of time, but there's just nowhere to go. So obviously on this one, Oregon catches Keaton Slovis getting a little bit greedy, trying to fit an over, over out to Tyler Vaughn's over the top. Obviously it doesn't work out. But let me walk you through how I'm seeing this play. And to start, I'll admit from the TV copy, it's kind of hard to diagnose what exactly the coverage is and what exactly or where exactly the free safety is. This free safety is not in the picture, but I can at least try to infer what he's doing. Oregon's going to line up in just a base 4-3 structure. Two corners are tighter, but what's unique, and I just alluded to it, is a safety play. I'm not sure exactly where the free safety is, and the strong safety is kind of hovering in the box, which is just, it's not weird, but just a little bit more unique, and it lends its hand to the athleticism that this Oregon secondary has where they can move people around. A lot of teams that face USC don't have the luxury to do it because they don't have the skill they can't afford to move guys around if this guy's then responsible to come back out here and cover this zone. Oregon's athleticism was definitely felt in this game. From the USC standpoint, once again, I can't see exactly what Amon Ra is doing, but he is doing some sort of vertical post or go route. This is the first read. If he can get over the top, let's say this was a true cover four look and this free safety's right here over Drake London, then he would be the winner. You try to have him run past the corner uh, and get above the safety and have him be the first progression. But even pre-snap, with a super high safety, if you're Keen Slovis, you pretty much can, can write Amon Ra off. He, his job on this play, based on this look, is going to be to run off this corner and run off this free safety and allow his buddies to make plays, whether it's the second read, Drake London, or the third read, Tyler Vaughn. Second read is going to be this dig route, or at least that's how I would read it. That's how I interpret this play. If Drake London can find a nice window in here, you'd bang this dig route and move on. Watching the play back, I'm not sure if Drake gets bumped or something, but it feels to me he's a little slow to roll, but he's ultimately not open. The mic kind of falls into it, the strong safety's right here, and uh, yeah, 15's out. But then it gets to the third progression, which is Tyler Vaughn's coming over to replace this vacated zone right here that these guys just left. I kind of treat this as the 3A read and this is 3B because both these guys 
are coming over to high low the nickel Sam. And that's exactly what happens with this play. This nickel Sam is ultimately the guy who makes this play, makes this interception because he drops under the zone. Keen's not able to get the ball over him and it's just jam packed and it's not crystal clear. So that's ultimately what happens. You kind of go one, two, to then their third progression coming over. That's where the pick happens. That's where Keaton gets greedy. Where this offense goes wrong or where they can be better is if you're Keaton and you sense that everything's getting soft, right? That all these backers are dropping, they're dropping under win windows, the corner's running deep, the safety's deep. You should sense that this pocket that's ideal that you're trying to throw in is just ultimately not going to happen. And if this Nickel Sam, who plays this well, he tries to tweener it, right? He knows the deal. He knows they're trying to high-low him with the drag underneath and an over over the top. So he kind of plays in the middle. But if that's the case, Eric Kromenhoek, and I'm not sure exactly how this is top, but this is how this is my reaction to what he does. He keeps running. He keeps running this way closer towards the sideline. To me, let's sit down right there. Let's force this Nickel Sam's hand. Let's force him to commit there or force him to go to Tyler Vaughn's right there. But right here, you should be able to sit down. It's a three-yard completion. He might fall forward for five, and let's move on from this play. This is a shot play. You're calling this play to get a big chunk yardage play, but that's not always what happens. And to me, whether it's Eric Kromenhoek sitting down on his own or if it's Keaton Slovis saying, hey, I know things are getting soft. Let me throw it on the back shoulder for Eric Kromenhoek right there. Because he's really just kind of jogging that way. He, he's not necessarily sprinting like an Amon Rise on the, on the backside. So if he's jogging over there, paint it on his back shoulder. Force the receiver with an accurate throw to kind of flip his hips and, go, and, 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 and really settle down. And you can move on. So that's where the ball should have gone. If this nickel Sam is soft, that all get into coverage. Bam. Eric Kromenhoek underneath. That is not that hard of an ask. It's not that, I mean, obviously it's football, right? Mistakes happen. This is a good play by the nickel Sam, but the ball should go there. And the next step, the next step for Keen Slovis, when you talk about looking into his junior year and where I think he needs to grow, is when you talk about kind of true mastery of the offense. Like, once again, we're splitting hairs here. Keaton had a, had a good year, and he's a special player for sure. But when you talk about mastering the offense, if you sense that this is soft, and you just, hey, this is great. I just don't like this for whatever reason. Marquee step, leaking out to the back. And I know it's tough, right? All your action, all your eyes are, are, are this direction. But as an experienced quarterback, who now he's got a lot of starts under his belt, if you feel that softness, let's flip your eyes around. Let's get it to step. Because with all this action going this way, there's a lot of space, a lot of room to make some plays out here. And Marquee steps wide open. You can dink it to him. This is harder. This is something you would be hard to ask a true freshman quarterback to do or a quarterback that didn't have that many starts. But when you get to Keene's level and you're facing a good defense in Oregon that covered this play well, it didn't cover it perfectly. There's plays to be made right there. Move on with the completion right there. But they play it well. If you sense that, check the ball down to mark key step. Allow your playmakers to make a play. There's pick number two. Let's check out number three. They fake the draw. Slovis in trouble, makes a man miss to extend the play. Now trying to get away from Mace Funa. He throws incomplete off of Hill's hands. Pocket, there's no receiver over there. Wow. And Hill, as you saw, there was a limp. All right, so obviously a costly mistake by Keaton Slovis, but let's, let's take it back a little bit and, and dive into kind of what he's thinking. On this play, USC is going to gap protection it rather than man protection, which is different. And they're going to allocate seven guys to the blocking scheme here. You talk about the impact of a pass rush over the course of the game. This is exactly it. Throughout most of the year, USC was not forced to go to seven-man protection and keep the tight end in, Eric Kromenoke, and Stephen Carr both in the protection to prevent this pass rush, which is only just a four-man pass rush. The whole line is going to skip down to their right. Eric Kromenoke is going to come back. He's going to block the defensive end, and Stephen Carr is going to help Chip. I alluded to this point on the first interception, but you've heard me talk about answers, and this is a great example once again of, of exactly what I mean. By having seven guys in protection and only three guys in the route concept, that's not that many answers, especially when Oregon can still drop seven guys, get pressure with four. If you're Keaton Slovis, you know that coming to the line. You know the deal. You know, hey, this ball's got to come out because I only have one, two, three options. I don't necessarily have a check down here because they're allocated here towards the, the, the blocking scheme. So credit Oregon, the pass rush by Kayvon Thibodeau and these boys all game long. 
impacted USC's protection call here, which was not to the benefit of, uh, of Keaton Slovis here. But protection aside, when you look at the read, from what I can see, this is uh, just an all vertical type concept. On the outside, there's the option to go vertical with, uh, if it's open with the ability to hook it down like we saw here with, uh, with Tyler Vons. That's the case for both, uh, both of these guys. And then with, uh, with Drake London, this is my football educated guess of what this route is. If it's a one high safety, he'll keep this vertical up the hash. If this safety was too high, he would look to bend it right here down the dotted line. And SC fans, you guys have seen this route a bunch over the last year or two of this big body receiver making plays in this range of the field. Right when the ball snapped, Keaton gets hung on the left side, or at least he, the first two steps of his drop, he's looking to the left side. He wants to go to Brew McCoy. And I mentioned the impact of the pass rush on this game. At this stage of the game, Amon Ross St. Brown is out. I would like to think if he was healthy, eight would be here instead of four. The reason I bring this up is Brew McCoy loses this one-on-one. -on -one. This corner eats up Brew McCoy. It's really hard to tell exactly what the route is. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a vertical and, he, and Brew just gets jammed or if it's just a true, if it's a called hitch and, uh, and this corner just eats him up. But Keaton hangs on this, and to me, rightfully so. I like that read. Why? Because this free safety, to me, is not in the equation. Yes, he could get over the top. I guess he could. But his body language, to me, I, I treat this as a one-on-one -on -one matchup just because of where the safety is. I look at this safety more as kind of looking to make a play in the box, not really helping out on Brew McCoy. And so rightfully so, Keaton Slovis is looking out there saying, all right, four, win this one-on-one -on -one matchup for me. This is where he wants to go make a play. You lose this matchup, it forces Keaton to quickly get off of it and come back to the right. But as a result, he's late on this thrower. It, it, it would take a big time play to look to your left, sort this whole deal out, then rip your eyes to the back side, realize Tyler Vaughn's hitched down, and this nickel Sam is screaming out here and throw it over him. If he was playing elite Heisman level status, he would have saw this release, quickly got off it, ripped his eyes to the backside, kind of knowing how soft this corner is. Pre-snap, this corner, Diamador Lenore, is playing really soft. So in your mind as a quarterback, you know, hey, my outside guy is probably going to hitch it down or curl it down and sit in this pocket. And if this guy's not here, I got to get here quickly. That doesn't happen fast enough for Keaton. It wouldn't. Ha I mean, most quarterbacks wouldn't have got there either. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to put that pressure on him necessarily. But this window closes on him as a result of this nickel Sam screaming out. This mic is flying. This mic. He read the game plan. He knows Drake London. He knows his deal. This mic is flying outside the box to get inside on Drake London, and both this mic's leverage, the nickel Sam kind of playing both a little bit, and the safety coming over this way. That really knocks Drake London out of the play. And so, Brew not winning his one-on-one. -on -one. The coverage does not lend its hand to 15 getting the ball. And so, Tyler Vaughn's is your only option. And we already talked about it. It takes a lot to go from all the way to the left, all the way to the right, in a split second with this nickel Sam diving underneath. This would have been a big-time throw. Not impossible, though. Not impossible. That's the stuff that you want to push Keaton on to try to rip it and grip this throw and, and fit it outside his frame, kind of like we talked about, and move on, especially once again, this corner is playing super soft. This corner might as well like not even be in the equation. He's so deep, trying to play in between both guys, and it's a late-game situation, right? It's second and eight, uh, only a couple minutes left. If you're Oregon, the number one thing is just don't get beat deep, and that's certainly the body language out here to the field. The read, I guess, where he should have gone is out here. It's hard to do, and so with that, hey, credit. Oregon, you won that snap. You won that snap then throw the ball away out here. Don't do whatever that was that Keaton Dud did. Not sure if that was trying to make a play or, or what that was. And the last thing I want to touch on is we've talked about the seven-man pro, but Keaton gets pressure here. You have seven guys blocking. There's only four Oregon guys rushing. That's it. And I don't even believe one of them was Kayvon Thibodeau. Uh, I'll have to watch that back. But they're still able to get pressure with four. We talked about that in the pregame show. To me, that was one of the critical factors is if Oregon could get pressure with four and not even just crazy pressure, but at least solid, just make it uncomfortable on Keen Slovis that allows their secondary to have seven guys in coverage. That's a win for Oregon. It showed up here late in the game, lent its hand to Keen Slovis making a mistake. And uh, this is just great team defense uh, by the Oregon Ducks. But there you have it. That's breaking down all three of Keaton Slovis' interceptions. I can't stress enough how evident it was to me 
the talent on the Oregon defense. You can see it versus other teams USC has played. These corners, these linebackers, they're not sitting back and, and being scared. There was no sense of fear in this Oregon defense, and I think that's what you need when you play USC. If you play USC scared, they'll dink and dunk their way down the field, and Keaton Slovis will go 17 for 18 in the first half. The flip side of that is if you play too aggressive and don't have the talent, USC will go over the top and absolutely torch you, and Oregon had the talent defensively to at least match up. This receiving core for USC is special. I'm not saying this secondary is better than this receiving core, but they did enough in the conference championship to get the win. But those are the three picks. Thanks for checking out the breakdowns. Thanks for watching. If you checked out every single one this season, I'll be looking to do more content in the off season. Be sure to check out trojansports.com for more USC related content and be sure to check out my own social channels, own YouTube channel for more football content. I'll link, uh, I'll link some, some links down below for you guys to check it out. But seriously, thanks for the comments, thanks for the views, and uh, I'll see you guys again soon.